people are going to stare at me anyway. Let's at least make it worth both of our time. I don't want to be used as inspirational porn. I'm not here to give you the warm and fuzzies. I'm not here to be some real, like, Disney figure. If I have inspired you to go out and take some action in your life and do something positive, then I will absolutely refer to myself as inspirational. Life is what you make of it, and I have zero intention of living mine quietly. I, I did a documentary and it, it did well. Since then I've done movies, I've done stand-up comedy, I've refereed wrestling matches. Going down the route of, of performing seems just like a natural transition, right? I have a, a twin brother called Neil. Actually, we're identical twins. Probably should welcome with that. Like, looking at us now, we look completely different. But when we were babies, we looked exactly the same. I think Mum fed the same baby twice once, and it wasn't me. Out of, out of myself and Neil, I am half an hour older, and it might well be the most important half an hour, not just in my life, but in human history. So we have the same condition called neurofibromatosis type 1, but it affects us both differently. He has short-term memory loss and epilepsy. So if you tell him to do something and he doesn't do it straight away, five minutes later, you're going to have to have the exact same conversation again. So I have a genetic condition called NF1 for short. What it's characterised by is non cancerous growth anywhere on the central nervous system called fibromas. Genes come in pairs, and we both share the same primary NF1 mutation. But it's when the second copy goes wrong that you get tumours. So when all this first started, it was just a small bump on, on my forehead. I was messing about in my room as, as a five-year-old, and I sort of banged my head on a windowsill. And then screamed, parents came in, checked the windowsill, checked the child, because priorities. And then, because I'm a fast learner, I did the same thing again, like two weeks later. And, and that's when we started asking more questions and going to see, see doctors. Like, I'm completely blind in this, I have been for, what, going on 20 years. Even if I did um, tighten the eyelids, it still wouldn't work, because the, the nerves at the back are just completely completely crushed and in this eye I got scarring on the front of the cornea and loads of um, fibromas around it which makes opening and closing it rather problematic. Um, I got a slight hearing loss in this ear and everything around here makes breathing not difficult but I've got to be really careful and keep an eye on it. I've had 38 surgeries on my face so far, 39 is currently being discussed and booked in, and I'm probably going to have a party for the 40th. It seems like a very crass Adam Pearson thing to do. I've already planned it, already invited my surgeon who's well up for it. I've had the same surgeon for quite a while now. He's not done all 38, but he's done well over half of them. Um, Simon Eccles at Chelsea Westminster. I think if you could just debolt that a bit and just support it a bit more at the side, yeah. that would be better. A good friend of mine, trust him implicitly, and I, I have a, a hard and fast rule. If someone's cutting your face open on the regular, you should at least be able to tolerate them and know their name. I got bullied quite a lot at secondary school. I was in a position where I was a lot smarter and a lot wittier than the people who were calling me names and giving me aggro. I'd be blowing people up in the playground, left, right and centre, and then I'd be the one who, who got in trouble. And so I thought I'd, I'd change my mindset. I'd, I'd put out good energy and see if that, that would change anything. And it, it made a real impact in, in my adolescent life. When I made the Horizon documentary, I got to go to Vietnam. Parts of Vietnam have unusually high levels of genetic disease and some of the worst cases of NF1 in the world. There were times when I felt a little bit like a spectacle, but then again, there, there are cultural variances that you, that you need to allow for and, and let people get on with it and ask, ask their questions. Meeting other people who have like not only far more serious um, symptoms in me, but have way less access to medical medical provisions than I do. It was a real emotional moment. It teaches me to not only be grateful for my 
my circumstances, what I have, but also makes you want want more for them. My mantra for 2021 is anytime there's an opportunity to educate someone on disability or have an important conversation, have it. If, if there's a moment where you're not certain what you should be doing in in your life or what difference you can make, I think there's three things that you can ask yourself and it's what do I like, what am I good at and what pisses me off. And when all three of those things line up, that's when you can make a real difference in, in the world around you. And it's almost like it sounds utterly grandiose and cliche, but you become a voice for the voiceless, wanting to make the world a fairer, better, more equal place for people with, with disabilities, to get to a point where someone like, like me can walk into a pub, have a pint, and no one stares, gets out their camera phone, or makes shitty comments. My biggest gripe by far when you deal with organisations in, in, the, in the disability space is the talk hardly ever matches the walk. I mean, we could just be finding and hiring disabled talent. Prior to lockdown, a lot of disabled people were excluded from, from the workplace based on the hypothesis that remote working isn't possible. So on March 23rd last year, when lockdown kicked in and non-disabled people needed to work remotely, oh how quickly it became possible. If we come out of the past year and however long with the exact same mindset that we went into it with, that is an abject failure for humanity. If I was to sit down with like younger Adam and give him some advice, first of all I'd tell him it, it all winds up okay. High school's dumb. None of none of this truly matters. You're gonna get you're gonna go to uni, maybe drink a bit less for the first year. Don't be ashamed of who you are. And if you wear your identity like armor, no one can ever hurt you. People have treated me differently because of the way that I look. A lot of people would stare at me. When I was younger I felt like an outcast and like I didn't belong. I embraced what makes me unique and then I became an international model. I am who I am. To me, beauty is really just a state of mind and a state of being. When I was younger, I literally felt very alone and I had a feeling like I was the only person in the world that was born the way that I was born. I would always just go to my room and draw. I love to just be able to be in an entirely different, fantastical environment. I was born with a medical condition called ectodermal dysplasia. It affects all of my endocrine system, which includes my hair, my teeth, my skin, nails, and glands as well as any soft tissue or cartilage. My vision has decreased greatly within the last 10 years. It affects my entire way of life. I do grow a little bit of hair, but definitely not enough for a whole head of hair. I grow little, like, little pieces, kind of like Tweety Bird. <laughs> I've had so many surgeries, it's incredibly hard to keep count of. The goal of it was always how to make Melanie look normal and behave and function normally. They were focusing on my various physical attributes and for me, these weren't exactly limitations. I felt a lot of pain, both physically and mentally. So when I was younger, I was really just looking for any avenue to kind of feel better at any kind of light, like a lightness of being. I ended up turning to drugs to self-medicate. There was one night, everything was just building up. In, in this moment of darkness, I made a little rag doll. I reminded myself of how much I love to create and that feeling of peace and like serenity I experienced while creating. It was that point on when I realized that 
I don't understand why my life is the way it is or why I was born the way that I was, but this is my reality and I just decided I would just focus on my artwork. It's very impossible to live in New York and not meet any creative people. A photographer actually reached out to me because they saw my drawings and they saw my self-portraits and they asked me to pose for them. I was very scared to put myself out there when I first started modeling. I had to kind of jumpstart all of this beauty and positivity. That looks great. Looks beautiful. Yay! When I model, I feel very free. And for a very long time, it seemed like the ultimate epitome of power. I look like the first oh, lady. You do. <laughs> It really helped me embrace who I was, not just my inner core, but my physical being as well. I think it's really awesome and beautiful to be able to be an example and source of inspiration for other people, especially people that are different or anybody that's felt different. People like me. For many years, I was literally just going. I was just going from job to job, flight to flight, project to project. I had started to get extremely burnt out from traveling and working. As my body is getting older, I definitely have to take more care in preserving my mental and physical health. On social media, it's definitely very hard because people kind of look at me as this person who has fully accepted herself and she believes she's beautiful and now we believe she's beautiful too. But there's just so many layers to being a human. I've learned that healing isn't linear uh, regarding anything and I still have moments where I struggle with who I am or my place. And a lot of that stuff isn't, you know, it's not all fun, positivity, sunshine, and rainbows. Some of it's like really heavy stuff. I actually use modeling and work as an escape from my problems. And you know, that's not very healthy. <laughs> I was so busy trying to make a career and maintaining that career, I lost myself. I finally decided that I needed a break. I started drawing and painting again as a way to regain my sense of self and identity. Like when I was a child creating and I was able to fully delve into a brand new world where I felt safe and I could kind of process through my emotions and also let them go. When I took a step back and really focused on my mental health and when I was able to come to a more positive place within my mind, my body kind of naturally followed. When I look back on my experiences and also just in knowing who I am as a person, I wouldn't change anything about it. I really love myself for who I am and all of the life experiences that brought me to where I am today. His brain was so badly damaged that it wasn't certain whether he would ever be able to walk or even talk again. and even 
medical students today are taught that you don't really recover, there's not much recovery after six months. I felt Richard was maybe the exception to the rule. Richard defied everyone's expectations. How are you today, darling? How are you feeling today? <laughs> it's very good at the moment. I mean, I can do things right now. I can talk to you, darling. I'd like to do things right now. Isn't it incredible? No, of course it is. It's wonderful, and I love it very much. I mean, look, uh, when Richard had his stroke, no one could be sure what would happen. We were warned he could die or he could suffer even further brain damage and uh, be rendered a, a, in a vegetative state. There was a large clot sitting over the surface of the brain, compressing the brain. So it was clear that he could well be left with significant deficits in memory, in speech, in personality, and he may well have a quality of life that he may not have valued or that his family may have felt on his behalf that he didn't value. Well, after surgery, it looked as if he'd lost half his brain. It was very shocking what on earth was left and what would he be able to do? It was very difficult because you felt part of him had gone and yet he was still there. And how could I grieve for my husband when he was still there? Would Richard ever be Richard again? One doctor had told me that a sign of a good recovery is if you can sit up on your own after four months. But this was nine months later, and Richard still couldn't do it. He was still very, very disabled. And he was in a wheelchair, he was being hoisted, he had no movement in his right side, he couldn't walk. Um, his receptive, his understanding of language uh, was pretty non-existent, and his speech was, was also barely there, to be honest. I was called into the clinical director's office of the neuro rehab unit where Richard was, and uh, he said to me, um, well, it, you know, it's 10 months and Richard hasn't really shown much signs of recovery. I think he's plateaued and he should go to a care home. And it was at that moment that I thought, well, absolutely not because I knew if he was sent to a care home he would die. I was able to get him to a wonderful neuro rehab unit in Kent called the Raphael Medical Centre. They came to assess him and one of them leaned forward and said I think we can help you Colonel Gray and with his left good hand he reached out and he grasped his hand and the look in his eyes I just thought you know, I don't care what I have to do, I have to get him to that place so that he can get better. When we first assessed Richard, his speech was non-existent. He had a white-tided weakness. In particular, he couldn't stand up on his legs on his own. So he was quite a, quite a complex individual. But behind that, one could see there was something there. There was a sort of certain spark in, in Richard. I knew Richard could be pushed to his physical and emotional limits. He was, after all, a seasoned soldier. It was almost like a light was switched back on and he became active in his own recovery. It was really remarkable to see a slow but steady improvement. That was, that, that's really good. You're doing it, darling. You're walking. You're walking, darling. I witnessed him relearn how to walk. Having started from the point where he might not survive, and if he did, that he might have massive cognitive deficits, to then see him laughing in an electric wheelchair and spinning around in circles, um, to see him laugh was incredible. And he'd come this extraordinary journey even then. Richard came home almost exactly two years after his stroke. And 
just the physical action of walking across the threshold was extraordinary. So Richard was referred to the Upper Limb Clinic at Queen Square. They find out what your interests are, what you really want to do. And with Richard, it was ironing, um, chopping for cooking, and uh, doing things in the garden. It was all geared and designed, you know, specifically for him individually. Over a period of about six months from the time he started the Upper Limb Programme to when he went for his final assessment, he was doing so well, he was becoming more and more independent. And so by the time we went for the final assessment, he was able to actually walk into the hospital unaided. When Richard first came home, he really wasn't able to say very much at all. And we lived almost in silence. How about um, engine? Mm. Yeah. Which one of these things has an engine? Yeah. yeah, one of those two. You're right, it is one of those two. For years, really, the concentration has been on his speech and language, his spoken uh, output and his receptive language, his understanding. It is remarkable, seven and a half years after a stroke, after a um, catastrophic brain hemorrhage, to hear him constructing sentences and for us to be able to start to have conversations is amazing. Washing our hands. Mm -hmm. Wash our hands. I think for all clinicians, you know, they're thrilled to see somebody recover as much as Richard um, because it is often unexpected. We're still here, darling. You're coming in to get a cup of tea. Yeah, we're still here. We're still here. Um, so, how, how are you today, darling? How are you feeling today? Oh, it's very good at the moment. I mean, I can do things right now. I can talk to you, darling. I'd like to do things with Isn't you. Isn't it incredible? No, of course it is. It's wonderful, and I love it very much. You made me love that. Yeah, seen. you're amazing. You're great. Yes. You're great. Very, and it was, very, very good. For me, right. it's really lovely Thank to you. hear Richard speaking so fluently. Well, I'm trying to. Which is brilliant. What do you think? What gives you the the strength of character to do that and not give up? Is it the yeah, army? I mean, yeah. Is it? Oh, thank you, darling. I don't process fat in the normal way. I have a condition that's so rare, I'm one in 584 million. People have a tendency to think that having no body fat as a cyclist must be great and it would be a tremendous advantage. But the reality is that it's a big disadvantage. I'm Tom Stanford, a passionate cyclist, and I have MDP syndrome. I rode for Great Britain uh, as a paracyclist um, and was actually the national champion in 2011. MDP basically stands for mandibular dysplasia with deafness and progeroid features. Because fat is so important for so many different biological processes, the fact that I can't process it normally has a terrific knock-on effect in lots of different ways. The mandibular dysplasia basically means small jaw, lots of overcrowding in the mouth with teeth, as you can see. My ears are functionally fine. The problem is I've got faulty signalling between the brain and my ears. I didn't actually get hearing aids until I was about 14. People are reticent to, to wear hearing aids because of the, the kind of the negative impression that oh, if you only old people have hearing aids, um, and that's just simply not true. And the progeroid features, sufferers tend to look much, much older than they are, just because we have no fat under the skin. So we always look a little bit gaunt and wrinkled. Another one of the symptoms is something called lipodystrophy. What we can see in the person who doesn't have lipodystrophy is round the edge of the body, there's a layer of fat and if you look within the tummy itself, there's very little fat shown in the bright white. And then if we look at Tom's picture, and this is striking that round the edge, there really is no fat, but within the tummy, we can see great accumulations of fat. So this is absolutely fat in the wrong place. I'm type 2 diabetic. Um, and the problem is that when I'm cycling very hard, my ability to basically transfer the food I eat and the sugars that I eat to the working muscle is quite difficult because my insulin resistance rises. MDP syndrome is basically saying, don't be a cyclist. 
As a cyclist, I used to shave my legs, um, obviously with no fat under my skin. Uh, shaving legs is not good, it's causing too many cuts, so I now use a hair removal cream. Walking is really difficult for me, but it also means that I have no fat on the soles of my feet. So it's almost like walking on the rocks of a, a stony beach all the time. Cycling is a bit different because most of my weight is carried on the saddle. So any pain that I feel on the bike, if you like, is pain that I've chosen. So conceptually and mentally, it's a lot easier to manage and it's a lot more empowering because basically I am the master of my own fate, if you like. Because MDP syndrome is caused by a spontaneous genetic mutation um, and genomic sequencing technology has not been around for all that long, for the whole of the first 23 years of my life, we had no idea what was wrong with me. Tom, like all of us, has three billion bits of genetic information. But just one of those was wrong in order to give him all these problems. It was a visiting doctor from India who told us that she'd got a patient. And there was this remarkable thing that we had this young man about the same age as Tom who had exactly the same physical appearance, who had lipodystrophy. Now suddenly we could understand why Tom had got diabetes, why Tom had got the other things as well, and we had a test that allowed us to pick out this syndrome with all the other features. My childhood was exactly like other people's childhoods, really. My mum and dad were really into making me experience as many things as I wanted to. We always approached my various conditions with a kind of a can-do attitude. There are lots of practical things that you can do that have an immediate and genuine positive effect on your quality of life. So in real terms, um, MDP syndrome obviously affects my daily life in lots of different ways. The first thing I do is put on my shoes or slippers so I can get out of bed. Most people would just do this barefoot, but obviously I can't. So the next thing I do is make an espresso. Um, I'm a huge fan of coffee. I've done a lot of research into caffeine um, and how it aids with uh, the perception of pain. Um, and has a kind of analgesic effect. For breakfast most mornings, I have a meal replacement drink. Using this gives me the convenience and more importantly, it lets me avoid unnecessary pain on my feet. There was a, a terrific kind of media frenzy about the MDP diagnosis. This misconception that you had this young man who can't get fat. And despite the, the media frenzy, the medical team have decided not to rename MDP syndrome, Stanford syndrome, um, and I'm crushed. <laughs> so it was wonderful that we had all of this kind of global press attention. Um, and what I wanted to do was hopefully find other people with the condition. That was successful. And there are now, I think there are 12 confirmed cases worldwide. So the diagnosis is really important to some people. And I can completely understand that because when you're the, the parent of a child with, with a, a condition that you don't know what it is, and at least by having a diagnosis, you have something tangible upon which to kind of place part of your emotional burden. For me, it makes absolutely no difference whether it has a diagnosis or not, because it's not going to lead to any treatments or therapies, at least for the next few decades. MDP syndrome is simply one aspect of my personality. It's not my entire personality. I don't ride a bike to be an inspirational figure. I ride a bike because I like riding a bike. If, you know, one of the side effects is that that perhaps inspires other people with the condition or with similar conditions to get out on their bike, then obviously that's a wonderful thing. I'm Wilco Van Cleef Bolton and I'm seven foot tall. I'm Keisha Van Cleef Bolton and I'm six foot six. And we are the UK's tallest family. I enjoy being known for my height. Being different is not, not a problem. Yeah, exactly. It's just you have to celebrate each difference. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's fantastic.
We have five kids. Lucas is six and five. Eva is five and eight. Jonah is five foot one. Ezra is three foot eleven and a half. And Gabriel is three foot ten. We met via the Tall Persons Club. I was getting really fed up of being approached by really short men. I made a post just asking if there were any tall men out there who wanted to join me to go for a dance. And I responded, I can't even dance. Still can't dance. <laughs> Still can't dance, no. You turn up late for the pub. Oh. Fashionably late, as always. <laughs> you didn't even notice me. No, I didn't. We just hit it off from there, right from the beginning. We've been inseparable since. <laughs> I don't think we've ever been apart for more than a couple of days. Yeah. It's, it's been a life changer. We could have foreseen that 20 years later, you know, we would have been married with five kids. We were married within the year. Engaged after three months, married, <laughs> married after six. <laughs> I come from a tall family. Both my parents are six feet and over. I believe my mom is about six foot one. I grew up in Jamaica and I was about, I was past six foot by the time I was 12 years old. I have one brother and two sisters. Um, my brother is about six foot two. I've never actually measured him. Um, and my sisters are around five foot seven, five foot eight. I'm seven foot tall at the moment. Uh, my shoe size is 15 and I believe I reached this height when I was around um, 15, 16 years old. I like to keep my head down, not be noticed, um, you know, not to stick, I'll stick out anyway, so I didn't want to stick out any more than I already did. My parents are not um, typically tall, they're about five foot six, five foot seven, I think. Yeah. Um, but my mum's brothers and um, her father, so my granddad, they were all tall, they were all over six foot. The, the, the Dutch are officially the tallest nation in the world. You do notice it, so you walk around the streets in the Netherlands and everyone's taller. As teenagers, they don't really like a lot of attention. They are used to being known as the tall kids. I am 12 years old. I am 12. I am either fat kids or tall. I enjoy being known for my height. I'm trying to encourage my children to be more positive about their height. Being tall, particularly for a female, might be seen as a negative thing. Um, I'm just encouraging my daughter to be proud of it. I remember Ava a few years ago, she was taking photos with her friends and I noticed that she was slouching and I encouraged her not to and now she's standing tall and being proud. It's opened up a lot of doors to new experiences. We've done quite a bit of travelling uh, for the Guinness World Records. We went to Italy, to Rome. We were there for a week to take part in this TV show. Um, yep, we went to Belgium and the Netherlands. So we did a little tour there for a book launch. We've done counters of interviews. I think it's all interesting experiences for the kids as well to be involved in. And just be um, proud of what they've been able to participate mm -hmm. in. Uh, in the current climate, it's just people are struggling to normalize differences. Um, so I think this is just one way we, we, we're normalizing heights. So also, you know, teaching our kids not to see difference. Because of our height, we've had to um, to adjust to create what is not already available. Mm -hmm. The reason you started woodwork in the first place was in our previous home, we created that we built a triple bunk bed um, because we had two bedrooms and we needed to fit three children in one room and still have space for them to play. We are able to adapt our environment to suit us. Work is a problem solver. Um, so usually I present the problem, um, sometimes create it, <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then, then I leave him to figure it out. So for instance, I told Wilco, we need a chicken coop. He had to figure out what kind of chicken coop we needed and he built it. 
The problem solving aspect is quite important as well and uh, I'm hoping the kids will pick up on it. If there's a problem in front of you, you can fix it. I've been doing archery for about, uh, since I was 14 I think, so I started in the Netherlands. Uh, the archery is not your typical tall friendly sport. There is really a limited number of arrows, well to the point now where I've got specially made arrows um, that are made longer than the, the standard factory made arrows. Sports-wise, Lucas has done basketball when he was younger. Um, he's not done much um, regarding sports lately because um, of his rapid growing, he's, um, has, he had some injuries. He's Osgood Slatter syndrome. Yep. So he is in pain in his knees a lot. So hopefully he outgrows that. Other than that, um, they followed me in, uh, in archery. So Lucas, Ava and Jonah, um, just before the lockdown, uh, we were, the four of us were doing archery um, a lot. Competitions. Yep, competitions yeah. and practice and everything. Most people might assume that we would make them do basketball, but we just give them that room to explore. We would like them to do some any sport that they want to, but nothing specific really. The advice I give my younger self is um, go with the flow well, yes, exactly. and just enjoy life, dance more, um, <laughs> Yeah, don't waste time crying about mm. something that you can't change. Yep, doesn't so work. that would be what yeah. I would tell my 16 year old self when I wish I could be shorter. I would tell myself not to, not to be sad about something I can't change, mm -hmm. it's, this is it. This is something to celebrate.